In the world of football, few names hold as much weight as Manchester United, an English titan with a legacy steeped in history and a fan base that spans the globe. The announcement of Qatar's Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad al-Thani sending out an official bid, the cherished club has ignited discussion worldwide, promising to usher in an era of renewed vigor and big ambitions. This acquisition would be far more than a change of hands. It symbolizes a seismic shift in the club's trajectory, one that could potentially redefine its future. Since its establishment in 1878, Manchester United has seen periods of glory and strife, yet the consistency of its spirit has remained untamed. As the club passes into the hands of Sheikh Jassim, renowned for his discerning investment decisions and passion for sports, it's worth considering the profound changes this move could bring about both on and off the field. For the Old Trafford faithful and international fans alike, this transition sparks a blend of anticipation, curiosity, and inevitable apprehension. Will the new ownership maintain the club's cherished traditions while navigating the modern landscape of football? How will the club's strategic and tactical approach evolve under the influence of Qatari investment? What promises does Sheikh Jassim's stewardship hold for Manchester United's return to its former glory? In November, after a period of nearly 18 turbulent years, the Glazer family decided to list the club for sale. Jim Ratcliffe, a British billionaire and founder of Ineos, a major chemicals group, proposed a bid to acquire 69% of the club's stakes, mirroring the percentage previously controlled by the Glazers. Simultaneously, Jassim bin Hamad al-Thani, a Qatari tycoon, son of past Qatari prime minister and a significant bank chairman, made a competing offer aiming to secure complete ownership. Both potential buyers were asked to present refined proposals by Wednesday evening, yet this deadline was pushed back due to emerging ambiguities among the present owners and the prospective purchasers. A press statement issued by Jassim's 9-2 Foundation painted an optimistic picture for the club's future under his control, promising investment in the football teams, the training center, the stadium, and the broader infrastructure, as well as the fan experience and the communities supported by the club. Jassim's bid to assume control of one of the world's most renowned football clubs follows Qatar's recent hosting of the World Cup and its successful bid to host the Asian Games in 2030. This move doesn't surprise industry insiders, who view it as a logical step in Qatar's quest to solidify its image as a global sports powerhouse. Jassim's interest in the club is not solely investment-driven, it also reflects a personal affinity, because as a lifelong fan, he's dreamt of being associated with the team he has supported since his youth. His bid was orchestrated through his 9-2 foundation, a name seemingly paying homage to Manchester United's legendary Class of 92 team, which secured numerous championships during the 1990s. Interestingly, 1992 is also the year Jessen reportedly began following the club. Jessen has voiced grand plans for both the men's and women's teams across all tiers. As per the press release issued by the 9-2 Foundation, his debt-free proposal outlines a strategy to restore the club to its past grandeur, both on the field and off it. This inherent advantage of investing in a club as globally recognized as Manchester United is that there is no need to channel billions into brand establishment. Instead, these funds can be redirected towards refurbishing the Old Trafford Stadium, enhancing the Carrington training facilities, and vitally injecting capital into the local community, as written in the official statement. The bid will be completely debt-free via Sheikh Jassim's 9-2 Foundation, which will look to invest in the football teams, the training center, the stadium and wider infrastructure, the fan experience, and the communities the club supports, a statement said. The vision of the bid is for Manchester United Football Club to be renowned for footballing excellence and regarded as the greatest football club in the world. While this would be a great thing for Manchester United, improving the facilities, which were in a way exposed to be really bad by Cristiano Ronaldo himself in that notorious interview with Pierce Morgan in January of 2023, it also inevitably poses big problems for the future, which we'll get into in a minute. Arab ownership in the football landscape of Northwest England's Manchester isn't a new phenomenon. Back in 2008, Manchester United City rivals Manchester City was acquired by a business consortium with ties to the United Arab Emirates royal family. Moreover, around 240 kilometers to the north, Newcastle United, another prominent English football club, has been under the ownership of a consortium spearheaded by a Saudi Arabian sovereign wealth fund since 2021. Despite these precedents, Jessen's bid for Manchester United has met with opposition from some factions of the club's supporters, who interpret it as an attempt to sportswash Qatar's controversial human rights record, an issue that has attracted scrutiny from Western media, particularly in the run-up to and during the World Cup. A manifestation of this dissent occurred during United's Premier League clash against Southampton on March 12th, when some fans unfurled a banner stating, No Qatari sports washing at United. 
The term sportswashing transcends mere public relations or image enhancement. It's a complex game of influence and institutional appropriation. As such, it's difficult not to view this acquisition attempt as the latest stride in its progressive evolution. The Premier League's failure to revamp its owners and directors' tests concerning state bodies and influence is all the more glaring and damning given the current circumstances. The league had plenty of time and ample warning, especially in the 16 months following the Newcastle United takeover. Amnesty International UK has publicly stated their anticipation for a follow-up from an October 2021 meeting, a response that is yet to materialize. The concurrent sale of the league's two most historic institutions, United and Liverpool, should have amplified the urgency. The present scenario could result in an uncomfortable reality where three of the Premier League's clubs find themselves owned or swayed by the three primary states behind the Gulf blockade. This ostensibly quintessential English competition risks morphing into a stage for political rivalries, fraught with serious themes and overshadowed by the state's criticized human rights records. Just to underscore the severity of the situation, human rights groups spent Friday evening engrossed in heated debates over whether this development could rekindle regional animosities. The Public Investment Fund's acquisition of Newcastle was given a green light based on the consortium's so-called legally binding assurances that they would maintain a separation from the Saudi Arabian state. However, this assurance, labeled a fantasy by one human rights worker, was unequivocally shattered when the PIF claimed sovereign immunity in a U.S. court, stating they were part of the Saudi government and hence should be exempt from revealing information tied to Live Golf's legal dispute with the PGA. One could only speculate how the Premier League might have navigated the scenario had the regulations been even modestly updated, but they weren't. This issue could potentially prompt a question for UEFA. Paris Saint-Germain is owned by QSI, a subsidiary of QIA. If Althani's bid is successful, UEFA's ownership rules might conceivably prevent United and PSG from competing in the same continental tournament, as some figures in the game weren't contending on Friday evening. Yet there was already a sense of confidence that this wouldn't pose a hindrance. UEFA could theoretically consult the European Club Association on this matter, but its president, Asura Khalifi, also presides over PSG, chairs QSI, and maintains close ties with the Emir of Qatar. La Liga president Javier Tebas's description of the PSG boss as having too many conflicts of interest becomes increasingly clear in this context, as does the final direction of the game and how it landed in this predicament. There's now a tangible chance that English football's most prominent institution will become the largest club yet to represent a sports-washing initiative, and in this context, no amount of victories would have genuine significance. There's a dire need for an independent regulator, but as the early stages of the United sale have shown, it might already be too late. All in all, while the purchasing of Manchester United by Sheikh Jassim and his 9-2 foundation would be great for Manchester United as a club and institution, all the good things would stop there. It would result in a domino effect further exacerbated by the already established owners of Manchester City and Newcastle, leading to a world in which if you're not owned by billionaire owners, you'll simply fall off and not be competitive at all. The potential purchase would mean inflating the player market even more and putting the financially weaker clubs in a very precarious position to not be able to purchase new players due to the huge prices. Such a problem could be fixed by a market and salary cap, but that's a completely different issue with its own logistical and political problems. At the end of the day, the Glazers do not need to sell the club, but the future of Manchester United and perhaps English football is partly in their hands, since the FA doesn't seem to properly manage these types of situations. It'll be interesting to see how everything develops. But what do you think? What will the future of the Premier League and football be should the Qatari statesman buy Manchester United? Let us know your thoughts and opinions in the comment section below, and we'll see you next time.